I am really, really excited to welcome all of you here to the kickoff webinar for our learning journey, the birthing of bioregional learning centers. Now, if any of you have done a learning journey with me before, you'll know that they don't really fit into a box and they're kind of hard to describe. And this one is even more so because the learning journeys we've done in the past uh, generally lasted for about six weeks and maybe eight weeks, so they'd be a lot shorter. This one's gonna be for six months and we're gonna have to pace ourselves to feel into why do we need so much time? And I think after the presentation I give today, you'll see why we need so time, so much time because what we're gonna lay out today is that this learning journey is not a normal, like an online course or a university course where there's a teacher who has knowledge and they share that knowledge and you come to learn it. And then maybe you have tests or you have some writing project. Like, yes, I have things to teach. Others here have things to teach. That learning exchange will be occurring, but actually the teachers of this learning journey are going to be the landscapes that we each live in and each other as people who love our landscapes and who have intimate knowledge of our local places or who have intimate knowledge with the challenges of trying to do regenerative work in our own places. And so what we're going to be doing is holding a way of learning amongst each other across different landscapes around the world. And we're gonna be trying to do some of the most challenging and most urgently needed work on the planet, which means we're not gonna figure this out in the span of a couple of weeks. The idea is we want to spend six months creating a rhythm of relating to each other that enables us to build a community of practice that can persist and deepen itself and very, very importantly, spread what we're learning into other communities. And you'll see how we're planning to support that to occur in the, the presentation I'm going to give in a moment. Now, the general structure of these webinars is that there'll be a time where We'll welcome everyone. And then, you know, like I'm doing right now, and then we'll have a presentation. During the presentation, it'll be just, you know, and like in lecture mode, I'll be, I'll be presenting to you, or we might have other guest speakers who present to you. And then there's going to be plenty of time afterwards for questions, comments, and discussion. And the idea is that these webinars are going to help to create a shared context for everything else that we do. And because these learning journeys do not have a recipe, and they're not really like other learning environments, the first webinar is just explaining what is this thing? How does it work? What can you expect? And, and you're going to see that what we're going to be trying to do in this learning journey is building up patterns of coherence over time, patterns of coherence that allow us to hold a tremendous amount of complexity. Because we're talking about things like, how do you regenerate a watershed? Or how do you create a cultural identity and patterns of collaboration across a region like the Great Lakes? You know, things that are, are oftentimes things we haven't had to do before that are bigger than what most of us have ever attempted. And those of us who have attempted it mostly have bruises and scars and good stories, but not necessarily a track record of demonstrating we did it because this stuff is really hard. And so that means we need to create contexts in which we can hold that complexity together. And we can learn how to hold it together because it's not gonna get easier except that it's gonna become more familiar. And then it becomes easier in the other sense that the more we feel supported and the more we feel like we understand what we're doing in a, in a collective way, that does make part of it easier, but actually doing the work is really hard. If we were going to talk about something that's easy to do, someone would have already figured out how to do it by now. And we're going to actually talk about things that you'll see. I know some things about how to do it. Some of you know some things about how to do it. But really, this is this is like frontier territory. We're breaking new ground. We're going into new terrain. And that means we need to have new ways of learning together. And that's why I need to give a webinar today about what is this learning journey and how does it work? So. Penny and I are going to be tag teaming this. So I want to introduce, so I'm Joe Brewer, and this is my partner, Penny Hypo. You've probably all been getting messages from Penny because one of the many hats she wears is she manages the tending of the community, a lot of administrative supports. She does the accounting and legal work, 
Um, in addition to, as you'll learn during the webinar today, she holds a space called the Interspa the Inner Space. She's a healer. Actually, maybe I'll shut up and let you no, introduce no, yourself. That's good. <laughs> that's all good. Just keep going. <laughs> um, so Penny and I are co-founders of the Design School. She's also my partner um, in life as well as in this work. And so Penny's going to be sharing as part of the presentation today. And so, um, so you'll start to get a feel for, in some ways, she puts me out front so that she can quietly observe things and then build up the real intelligence we need to do things. Um, so I'm sort of like the dog and pony show, and um, and she's the one that's managing the box office, <laughs> but making sure everything runs smoothly behind the scenes. Um, but she's actually doing a great deal of work, as you will see. Um, even though I'm sort of the extrovert, she's the introvert in this dynamic duo. <laughs> um, some of you know Penny and me, and you know our dynamic. So, um, so what I want to do now is I want to go into presentation mode, which is I'm going to share some slides with you, and there will be a couple of moments where we'll actually pass over the microphone to Penny and we'll step out of the presentation. And she's gonna show you some things for how to navigate the Mighty Networks platform and how we're already encouraging <clears throat> self-organizing around geography and bioregions to be able to hold some of the richness of what we're gonna be doing. And you'll also see that we're doing this in more than one language. So also on our team are Tanya and Ceci who are here in Body Chara, Columbia and with us on the screen. Tanya and Ceci are waving at you there if you see them. And they're helping to hold the Spanish language platform because we're going to be doing this in English and Spanish. But we'll get to that because that's part of the presentation today. So let me jump into screen sharing mode and we can get started. And so the key thing here is that what we need to talk about is that we're doing this learning journey in the Design School for Regenerating Earth, and we called it Birthing of Bioregional Learning Centers. So somewhat paradoxically, I'm not gonna talk very much about bioregional learning centers today because I just wanna lay the, lay the context out of this learning journey and we'll spend time, you know, we've got six months for this learning journey. We'll go much more deeply into bioregional learning processes and what bioregional learning centers are and why they're so important uh, a little bit further down the road. But before we do, we need to see how would we tackle something like Bioregional learning centers implies that there's some kind of learning exchanges at the scale of a holistic landscape with lots of collaboration. How do we learn to do that in an online environment? And the answer is mostly we don't. Mostly we're going to do this in the real world. And I'm going to show you how we're going to dance between digital and on the ground throughout the next six months. So to begin, we need to really set the context of why are we on this journey? And we're in a time right now where humanity by and large, with the exception of some intact indigenous cultures that are definitely the minority in terms of the 8 billion human people, human population on earth, the vast majority of us are human beings who have lost their way. So if I was to ask you, how does a river find its way back to the sea? And the river in this picture, that's the Green River in Canyonlands, Utah, somehow, it needs to find its way to the Sea of Sea of Cortez and Baja California, Mexico. And those of you who know the story of the Colorado River, you'll know that the Green River and the Colorado River no longer reach the sea because of the dams and the extracting of water for all kinds of things that happen in the desert southwest of North America. But if we were to ask, how does a river find its way back to the sea? We know that rivers, by and large, know how to do this. They follow the pathways of attraction for gravity. They follow the pathways they themselves carve into the earth. But humans, maybe we've lost track of those natural rhythms and natural patterns. How do we find our way back to our own metaphorical sea, the primordial sea that gave birth to life on this planet? How do we find our way back into the living presence of the earth? This is what we're going to be exploring in this learning journey. We're gonna be exploring how to deeply connect with our landscapes, how to connect with the source of life and how to find our way back home. Because see, for most of us, we're asking some really big questions. We're asking questions like, where am I going? Do I know where I'm going? Do I know how to get there? We might ask this question personally for ourselves. We might ask this for our families. We might ask this for our local communities. 
We might ask this for our nations, for our regions, or for the planet as a whole. Where are we going? How do we know where we need to go to and how do we get there? And related to that, where do I belong? So many of us in the world today live in cities, working corporate jobs in a globalized supply chain that's pretty much thoroughly disconnected from place. How do we know where we belong? How do we know where we're supposed to be in this grand menagerie, this human drama that is filled with threats and challenges right now? Another way of asking this question is, if you knew where you belonged, you would know where you will bury your bones. You see, your bones are minerals that you've received from the earth, animated by water and fire and air to give your body animated life. And at some point, you're going to give your body back to the earth. Do you know where you will bury your bones? Because knowing how to answer this question gets you a very long way in knowing where you belong and where you need to place your time and attention and care. Another way of asking this is this way. In these troubled times, to whom do I give my precious love? Some of you know my story that I've been giving my precious love to Bio Parque Moncora and Barichara, Colombia in the Northern Andes of South America. But I'm from Missouri in the United States and North America. How did I end up choosing to give my love to Bio Parque Moncora in Colombia? You see, this question is important because we have very precious little time. The changes that are happening are accelerating and intensifying, and we need to give our love to the world in the time we have left. How do you know where to give your love or to whom? Which doesn't restrict itself to humans. I might give my love to the Seba Barigona, which is a native tree of Chicamocha Canyon that I didn't even know existed until I came to Colombia a very special being that I wrote about on Facebook this morning. I didn't know I was going to give my love to the Seba Bardigona. I didn't even know it existed. But this beautiful, precious being needs my care, and I feel called to give my love. To whom will you give your love is one of the questions we're going to explore throughout this learning journey. The way I want to frame this learning journey is in an indigenous wisdom tradition of some of the people of Turtle Island, also known as North America. Turtle Island is an indigenous name for North America. And there are these special prophecies that are about 700 years old from the Anishinaabe people of the Great Lakes. And the Anishinaabe people have the prophecies for the seventh and eighth fires. And the prophecies go like this. In the time of the seventh fire, humanity awakens to a world in trouble. People begin to see that things are wrong, that things are breaking down, that the future is dangerous. They begin to see the pending apocalypse. This is the time of the awakening of consciousness for the planet, the time of seeing that our way of living in the world is not working and it's not going to continue for much longer. But then they have the prophecy of the eighth fire. And they say, in the time of the eighth fire, humanity must be prepared to choose between the path of fire, which is the scarred earth path, the path of destruction and extinction for humanity and the death of many, many species, or to choose the green path that is in service to the continuity of life. Now notice that the eighth fire requires that we come prepared. We have to know how to destroy the earth's biosphere. Seems we're doing a pretty good job of that. But do we know how to act in service to life at the scales that are needed? Do our indigenous brothers and sisters have enough healing of cultural trauma in their communities to be able to share their wisdom with those who did not receive sacred instructions from indigenous culture? Start to see that the preparation for the eighth fire includes this learning journey. Because you see, we're right here. We are somewhere between the seventh and the eighth fire. When we had the Seven Generations Bioregional Earth Summit about a month ago in the greater Takaranto bioregion, we had a wisdom keeper of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples tell us that we're still in the seventh fire, 
but were getting closer and closer to the eighth fire according to their ancestral traditions. What that means is more and more of us are awakening to the apocalypse, but now we must prepare for the eighth fire because we cannot be empowered to choose the green path unless we know how. And this learning journey is a little bitty piece of that, just a little bitty piece of how we can choose life at the scale of a bioregion. So one way of seeing this pending collapse, and if you've seen some of my other talks, you've seen me talk about the planetary boundaries. Planetary boundaries are nine critical thresholds of the Earth system that if you cross even one, our globalized civilization as we know it is called into question. And when researchers identified these nine different, uh, these nine different critical thresholds, and then they asked, how are we doing? Well, in 2015, they published a paper saying we crossed the critical threshold for climate change, biosphere integrity, which is the rate of extinction in the biosphere, land system change, which is the destructive destruction of intact ecosystems, and biogeochemical flows, which is reactive phosphorus and nitrogen from synthetic fertilizers in industrial agriculture. That by 2015, they'd actually been crossed before, but the research was conclusive by 2015. And then they went on and did more research, published more papers in 2021, and said, oh, oops, we've also crossed the threshold for freshwater use and for ocean acidification. And then in 2022, they said, ah, oh, wait, microplastics, a novel entity that the Earth system doesn't know how to deal with, are now ubiquitous in every water supply on Earth. They can be found in clouds above the Himalayas and in the breast milk of every mother on the planet. These long-lived uh, toxic reactive chemicals are everywhere. So these novel entities of microplastics have also crossed the threshold. This is one way of saying we're in the seventh fire, that we're awakening to the pending apocalypse. We're awakening to the fact that we have already crossed critical thresholds of the Earth system. But all right, what does that look like in practice? Well, last week, I took these photographs. The picture in the upper left is the, the mountain range to the west of Barichara, where I live in Colombia. The picture in the middle is just a little schematic, a map of the Northern Andes in Colombia. You can see we're sort of in that, that turned part, the part that makes a little arch out and back like the shape of a boomerang on the right side of those mountain ranges. We're right in the middle of that. And what you can see in the picture in the upper left is all of that haze is from wildfires near Bogota filling these canyons. The other photographs you see are pictures I took from the airplane last week, flying from Bogota to, to Bucaramanga, basically flying across part of the Northern Andes. Because we have to ask ourselves, why are there wildfires near Bogota? Anyone who knows their ecological history will know the Northern Andes are filled with tropical rainforests and cloud forests. Tropical rainforests and cloud forests don't usually start on fire. But if you fly over this region, you'll learn that about 80% of the forest has been cut down across the entire Northern Andes. And these are pictures of some of the scars of photographs I took from the airplane last week. To show you that this is an example. Um, Stephen, if you could mute people for me, please. There's a little background noise. Um, what you can see is that we have actually crossed a critical tipping point in the moisture levels of the Northern Andes. And now, Wildfires are happening on a weekly basis across different parts of the Northern Andes for the last three months. And this is another example, a more localized example in South America of what we're talking about. I think we all have our horror stories like this. So the question becomes, how do we prepare for the eighth fire? Because this learning journey is part of that preparation. Part of how we prepare for the eighth fire is we have to hold and feel the pain and grieve the loss of what is happening. We have to remain sensitive to life. And as Stephen Jenkinson, the hospice worker has said, anyone who awakens their consciousness to the earth during this time will awaken with a sob. Because to awaken to the world today and to feel the life force of the world is to feel an immense amount of destruction and death. And one of the main reasons that we don't grieve the loss is that we don't let ourselves feel it. So practicing feeling what is happening is an important part of the preparation for the eighth fire. Because as we come to a place of acceptance in our grieving process, we are able to start recovering the ability to see the wisdom all around us. 
We can gather the wisdom from indigenous traditions. We can gather the wisdom from community care and well-being in our economies and our communities. We can gather wisdom from the best of science. We can gather wisdom anywhere wisdom exists to help us to act in service to life. And as we begin to grieve the losses, connect with life, gather the wisdom and apply it in service to life, what starts to happen is we find our way home. We find our way back into the earth's living processes. We find our way back into the bosom and the arms of our mother, Mother Earth, who gave us life. And as we do this, we are preparing for the eighth fire. We're preparing for the ability to choose life instead of defaulting to death, which is the path that we're all on right now. You know, business as usual leads to collapse, destruction, and every harm that we're seeing in the world today. So we have to choose a different path. And this is how we prepare for it. So this learning journey is going to bring some of this wisdom and some of this knowledge and some of these practices of preparation into being. We're going to bring some of them together. How do we know how to do this? Well, there's a lot more than what I'm about to show you. But part of the history leading up to this learning journey is between 2020 and 2024, there was a platform called Earth Regenerators. I was its founder. It started as a study group for my book, The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. It attracted thousands of people who learned together in a huge variety of ways. And during the four years of Earth Regenerators, we hosted six learning journeys. And those six learning journeys le taught us a lot about how to create this relationship between complex topics, online learning, and on the ground engagement. And so we're bringing a lot of that learning from those previous learning journeys into this process. Then also in the last year and a half, there's been a huge amount of work in the Design School for Regenerating Earth, which you might notice, and this is a graphic from November of 2022 to November of 2023, and the Design School was born in March of 2023, a year ago. What happened was starting in November of 2022, Penny and I began our first visits to Colorado and the prototyping of a process we call bioregional activations, which we then did more of in late January, early February of 2023 in the Great Lakes, focusing on the greater Toronto bioregion, the Finger Lakes and Rochester, Genesee River area and upstate New York, and the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland around Lake Erie, sort of organizing around a part of the Great Lakes. And then we birthed the design school. In May and June, we did a, an activation tour from the headwaters to the Sea of Cortez for the Colorado River, the Regenerate the Col Colorado activation. We started creating all kinds of creative structures in the design school for leadership, for how to work with landscapes, to how to allocate funding from the design school fund. We learned a whole bunch of stuff. We went and did more work in the Great Lakes. We went and did more work in the Colorado Basin. And then in October last year, we did this huge and exhausting, but very transformational bioregional activation tour called Regenerate Cascadia, the birthing of Regenerate Cascadia, partnering with Brandon Let Letzinger and Claire Atwell, who are based in the Cascadia bioregion. And then we did some strategic follow-ups in the Colorado Basin in December, all the while practicing creating different kinds of learning supports. And then about a month ago in February of 2024, partnering with the Legacy Project in the greater Toronto bioregion, we co-hosted the Seven Generation Bioregional Earth Summit. That's with Brian Pupa and Susan Bozak. And we launched, we actually birthed Bioregional Earth as a narrative about a month ago. So all of this is preparation for the learning journey that's now beginning to unfold. So you see, there's a lot of learning, a lot that's happened. And during all of these bioregional activation tours, where we visited communities, gave talks and workshops and strategy meetings and, and helped to weave conversations together across landscapes, all of that was happening in North America. We learned a great deal about what is needed and that gave rise to this learning journey. We learned, for example, that everywhere we went, the idea of organizing around physical landscapes like watersheds and coastal estuaries or you know, alluvial floodplains or other kinds of landscape systems, that this idea of organizing our actions into landscapes, people find this very compelling everywhere we go. Like, wow, this just makes sense. How do we do this? 
Some people are already doing it. Some people have never even thought of doing it and are just getting started. But the idea itself is very compelling to people, which means we need to have a shared space for learning how to do this. Also, everywhere we went, people intuitively get the importance of bioregional learning centers, even if they don't know what they are, which means we need a learning journey about bioregional learning centers. What are bioregional learning centers? How do we create them? Why is it that it makes so much sense? As we would travel through a landscape where we were invited, whether it was in Cascadia or the Great Lakes or the Colorado Basin, that everywhere we would go, we would say, you have all of these learning activities about your place. They're already happening. Can you weave them together? And they would say, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I think we need to create bioregional learning centers. And by the way, in 1983, Dana Meadows, the writer of the author of the Limits to Growth Study and the, the author of the book on systems theory, she said, you know, the only way for us to get to planetary sustainability 41 years ago is to organize ourselves as local living economies, and every one of these has its own bioregional learning center. Turns out this idea has been around for a while. It just sort of got pushed under the rug for a while, so most people don't know about it. But as we bring it back out into the light, it makes a lot of sense. But unfortunately, the words bioregion and bioregional learning center are becoming buzzwords. Everywhere we go, we see people using these words. They're throwing them around. But by and large, if you push and poke and prod, there's not much substance. A lot of people don't know the 50-year history of bioregionalism. They don't even know what a bioregion is. And they don't, want a bio, they don't know what a bioregional learning center is. Now, there are some people who definitely do. But there are a lot of people who are just discovering these words. And what we're finding is, this creates a lot of confusion, it creates incoherence, and it breaks down where it limits our ability to collaborate, that we actually need better shared understandings, which means we need shared language and we need a community of practice around bioregional regeneration and bioregional learning centers to help build coherence that does not currently exist out in the world. Now, those of you who are on this call that do work with bioregionalism, regeneration at large scales with learning centers, you know that there's a lot of good work out there, but you also know that it's a tiny percentage of people relative to humanity as a whole who even know this is happening at all. So we have a huge amount of work in building shared language, shared culture, and shared practices, which means the main purpose of this learning journey is to create scaffolding for coherence to emerge across all of our disparate era efforts around the world. We desperately need coherence among our efforts. Even if I don't actively work with Jenny Anderson and her team in the UK, we need there to be coherence between our efforts. And there's not coherence without shared language and culture. And so a big part of this learning journey is to build that shared language and culture. And we need time to do that. So. The focus of this learning journey, the outcomes we aspire toward are very ambitious because these are the outcomes that are needed. Not because I feel super confident like you will definitely reach these outcomes. I'm actually gonna guarantee you, we will reach none of these outcomes if you don't step up and do your part because we actually need humanity to step up and do our own parts in service to this very complex work. But the things that are needed from this learning journey are that we need to learn about bioregions. We need all of us to know what are bioregions, what is the history of bioregionalism, how do you define a bioregion? And then also, we need to learn about our own bioregions. I live in the Northern Andes in Santander, Colombia. I need to learn about my bioregion. But also, we need to learn about each other's bioregions. We need to learn about the bioregion that's in the Connecticut River. We need to learn about the bioregion that's in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. We need to learn about the bioregion that's in a southern part of Africa. We need to learn about each other's bioregions. What that leads to is we want to work toward creating a planetary learning community. People who are learning about bioregions and learning to regenerate bioregions need to have shared language, shared practices, social relationships, events that we can come to, that we can invite each other to, online learning exchanges, in-person learning exchanges all over the world. So we want to scaffold the creation of this planetary learning community. And by the way, this does not begin today. This began years ago. We need to take this further. 
I was part of the team of the Regenerative Communities Network in 2019. Some of you, like Ben Roberts is on the call today, is still on the team of the Regenerative Communities Network, still doing this work. So it's not that this is starting from scratch, it's that we really need a planetary learning community that is more elaborate, more robust, more coherent than it was before the learning journey. We all need this. And that means that we need to practice organizing our landscapes. And our, our landscapes need to be organized. It's in both directions. We need to organize around the restoration of our watersheds. And to be a planetary learning community, we have to practice, and we practice by organizing our watersheds. So this organizing of our landscapes is a part of what we're doing in the learning journey. So it's part of what we need to accomplish. And that means in our landscapes, because we're focusing on bioregional learning centers, that we're gonna organize our landscapes around learning ecosystems for our bioregions. We're gonna learn about what bioregions are, how to map bioregions. We're gonna learn what story of places. We're gonna learn what it means to learn about your place. We're gonna learn what it means for our place to be a learning ecosystem. We're gonna learn how to weave the parts of our learning ecosystems, which as a shorthand is what we call a bioregional learning center. We need to create these bioregional learning centers. So one of the outcomes of this learning journey is that there are more bioregional learning centers in September than there are now. See, this is the real work. And that means we need to hold and support and sustain learning exchanges among bioregions. Penny has done a lot of design work on Mighty Networks. Mighty Networks is a very limited technology platform. You're gonna be as frustrated as Penny, no, Penny will probably be more frustrated than you because she knows how bad of a technology it is, maybe even more than you do. But it's good enough to work for what we need for now. So we're going to use it to support exchanges among bioregions, which is something we need to hold throughout the next six months and beyond. And as we do that, that creates more coherence toward more of humanity living bioregionally as part of the Earth, which is where we're all going on the longer time frame of the next 100 to 200 years. We want to have more coherence six months from now than we do now. This is what we're trying to achieve with this learning journey. How the hell are we going to do this? Well, first of all, we're going to anchor ourselves to a natural pattern because the duration of the learning journey, you might notice it's March 19th, roughly the spring equinox of the Northern Hemisphere. My mother's birthday is tomorrow. She was born on the first day of spring in North America. That the duration of the learning journey is anchored from equinox to equinox. We're going to go from March to September so that we can feel the rhythms of the planet turning and the planet moving through its orbit as we feel ourselves connecting with our landscapes. So we're going to use the very structure of time in the learning journey to connect us to the temporality of the Earth-Sun orbital system, which is what gives life to our planet. So it's an extremely important foundation on which to build. Another thing I want to express is that we know everyone's busy. And we know that if we told you, you're going to spend 20 hours a week in this learning journey, that most of you would go, ah, throw your hands up in the air. No, you wouldn't. You would just quietly stop showing up because you're too busy. You have too many other things going on. We also know that some of you are just here to learn. You're like, I don't know how to do this, but I want to learn. I want to watch the webinars. I want to connect socially with other people who are trying to do this. And so you don't really need a lot of time and energy and focus because you have other things to do in your daily life. Whereas others of you are like actively working as your full-time work to organize community processes in your landscape. And you're very, very committed to that work. And so what we realized is we need a flexible structure where basically what we ask of everyone in the learning journey is the bare minimum. The bare minimum is three to five hours every two weeks. Three to five hours every two weeks. And it looks like this. Every other Tuesday, we're going to have a webinar like this one for about 90 minutes. And then every other week on the same week, on Thursday, we're going to have two times for design sessions. Western Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere. Basically, Penny's going to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to uh, on Friday mornings to work with people in places like New Zealand and Australia. And the idea is that in these design sessions, there's basically a Western Hemisphere time zone and an Eastern Hemisphere time zone. 
and we ask people to come and we're going to apply what we talk about in the webinars in design sessions on the same week on Thursdays. And then notice there's an alternate week where you don't have to do anything. You can if you want to. I'm about to show you we have a lot of other activities you can choose to get involved in. But we want to offer a minimal scaffolding. We ask you to please watch the webinars, either live or as recordings, and try to attend as many of the design sessions as you can. In addition to that, for those who want to do more work, we're going to provide additional supports to those people. So we're going to be using the alternate weeks to do the same thing in Spanish. See, I'm going to host this learning journey in both English and Spanish, where one week the webinar is in English, the next week the webinar is in Spanish. And if you happen to be bilingual in English and Spanish, please reach out to Penny and she'll invite you to join the Spanish language platform for free. Basically, we want to create learning exchanges across the languages. So those who speak Spanish will be in the Spanish platform. Those who speak English will be in the English platform. And those who are bilingual sign up for one and automatically can choose to join the second by just letting Penny know. Because the idea is we need to weave North and South America, but there's a huge language barrier. Notice that we're excluding the largest country in North and South America, Brazil, that speaks Portuguese. But that's just because I happen to speak English and Spanish, so I can do this in both languages. I apologize to my Brazilian friends. Um, I know how important your country is, but um, it's just that I don't speak Portuguese. So we are now expanding into Spanish. As of last Friday, we have the platform ready and people are starting to enroll. And we're going to have a time delay of two weeks. The Spanish version starts on April 9th. So in, a, in basically three weeks' time, the first Spanish language webinar will begin. And if you happen to be bilingual, reach out to Penny and she can invite you to join the other platform if you would like. And so we're gonna be holding this rhythm so that Penny and I can support the learning across both languages. So we can travel and do bioregional activations. So you can have the time to do the work you need to do in the rest of your life. But if you want to, you can do more. Because you see, we have, a very, very strategic priority, which is while this learning journey is hosted on a digital platform, our intention is to give more weight to efforts on the ground. So what that means is we know bioregions need to be regenerated. And while we're gonna hold these webinars and design sessions every other week, what we really wanna do is help you organize your landscapes locally, to bring resources and support to your landscapes locally, to help you to support each other, in your landscapes locally. And that means that the most important work in this learning journey is not the webinar, it's not the design session, although the webinar and the design session will help us build shared language, shared approaches, and shared tools. The real power is applying what we're talking about in all of our different landscapes and sharing our learning with each other using digital organizing to do so. And so we already have three regions that have started organizing. See, several regional coordinating groups have already been formed. There's one for the Mediterranean, one for Cascadia, and one for the Great Lakes Basin. And so Penny's gonna talk with you about how we are helping to set this up, because if you don't live in these three regions, she's already given you a survey to fill out to start mapping your geography to help us play matchmaker and help you to connect with each other so you can organize with each other regionally or bioregionally. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Penny to, to share. Great, thanks. So, um, Jill, could you go to the design yeah. school itself first? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I just wanna show where those three events that Joe just showed are, where you can find it in the platform. This is the view from, from a laptop. And on a, on a mobile device, it's underneath the hamburger menu, This uh, the hamburger icon. If you open that menu, this is where uh, these options will appear. So if you scroll down to the live learning, or actually not to the live learning center, to the bioregional learning exchange space under home, this is where these events are posted so far. And you'll see here, there's the Great Lakes Basin meeting, the Mediterranean bioregion, meeting and the Cascadia regional meetings. And they're repeating in the off weeks um, between in the weeks between the webinars and the design sessions. So so our idea is to is to help create 
or help support the creation of these groups, these regional group, regional cluster groups in the beginning of this by, of this learning journey, so that you can all gather together in in sort of these bigger regions and then decide what you want to do. There might be like in Cascadia, there's so many people and so many different landscapes within this region that maybe they'll be working in smaller groups. They might break out into work groups for each landscape and so forth, and, and you'll be able to decide that within your group. So I wanted to show you from this survey that you have, a lot of you have filled out the groupings that are showing up so far. So go ahead and show that. So the first grouping here is the Cascadia group, and you see there's a whole bunch of people already um, saying, you know, that they're in Cascadia. They You might not have joined that call yet, but you can just go to that event and join the the Cascadia call. And then the next grouping that we're starting to see is the West Coast. So mostly people in California here, or people, the people in purple on this list are people that, that alternate between different landscapes. So some of the time they're in California, some of the time they're not. Then the next grouping we're seeing is the Great Lakes, which is our biggest grouping so far because we've done so much, so much work there already. Um, and Brian and Susan are gonna be holding that regional call. And then another big grouping that's starting to come forward is the Northeast. So Joe and I are gonna be going to Connecticut and Maine at the end of this month. And um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, Vermont, um, New Jersey, et cetera, are, people are showing up from there. So, so what we're gonna want is is these groupings that don't yet have a, a coordinator, we're gonna be asking for somebody to step forward in, in these groups to host, just host a regional dialogue space. So then we have the Southeast, so places like Florida, et cetera, uh, North Carolina, and, um, and then the Great Plains, we have just a few people so we'll have to talk about um, in our Thursday and Friday sessions this week, how do we want to organize people who have just like a few a few people in their area? Do we want to make bigger groupings, um, et cetera? So we are going to, that's what we're going to use the design sessions for this week to talk through some of these details. So the Great Plains, the Great Basin and the Southwest. And so that's North America. So then in South America, we have um, a few, a few people that I think didn't even fill out the form yet. More than this, I know we have more than this, um, but we have people in the Northern Andes and in the Central and Southern Andes. And we have some people from, yeah, we have Brazil, people from Brazil joining and, and so forth. So we'll probably have maybe one group for all of us and then we'll start to split out into- and That one might even turn out to be in the Spanish language. Right, oh, yeah. yeah. And then we have the Mediterranean area which is, as you, as we all know, spans Europe, Africa, and Asia. And we have um, several, we have that group already started being led by Elias and Karim and Hadi. And um, so that's a really interesting group that's already been in process. So uh, I'm excited to see where that goes. Then we have Africa and we have Actually, we had another person just joined from Africa this morning, so we're getting a few more people from Africa, um, lower down in the sub-Sahara and southern area. And then in Europe, we have northern Europe, and then northwestern Europe is really like the UK, England, Scotland, and we keep getting more and more people from there coming in, and central Europe, a couple people, one person in Poland, one person in Germany, and then we just have a few people who filled out the form from South Asia and Oceania. And I know we have, we actually have a lot more people in Australia than this, but they just haven't filled out this form. So we're not sure if they're participating in the learning journey or, or what's happening with them, but we will see as we get going. So you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to add that what you can see is we're starting to form clusterings around geography as a prompt to help scaffold people into the geographic clusters that make sense to them. So if you don't like these clusterings, at least you found people who are geographically close and you can all talk together and say, actually, we'd rather call ourselves the UK or we'd rather call ourselves the Danube 
you know, like you can pick different groupings. And what we want to do is to just encourage that to happen because we think the most powerful learning in this learning journey is going to be the learning within these regions, which is across neighboring landscapes and across these regions as these groups become more coherent. And we want to encourage that to occur. So that this is a really important part of the work. And so you can already see that what we're thinking about is this learning journey is going to help support the creation of a planetary learning community and support the organizing of local and regional landscapes. And so continuing with the presentation, one of the things that's a secret sauce or a secret ingredient, which we learned during the Earth Regenerators learning journeys is that the Earth Regenerators platform had a, an entire community of people working on its governance because there were thousands of members. But the quiet governance, the governance that we designed and created with a community regenerators cohort in the very beginning was the governance in time of everything being matched to the temporal flow of the learning journey, which says the learning journey has a regularity to it. And this regularity allows you to coordinate around it. And coherence arises across time. What this means is that the other activities in the design school, as well as all of your other activities in real world contexts, can seek harmony with the regularity that we're providing. What do I mean by this? Well, this is what I mean. Over the span of six months, we're going to have a webinar and a design session every other week, which means that's a pattern that just repeats every two weeks. Webinar on Tuesday, design session on Thursday, wait a week. Webinar on Tuesday, design session on Thursday, wait a week. And for six months, we're going to have that rhythm. During that rhythm, which is a very simple heartbeat, that very simple heartbeat allows us to explore bioregional learning exchanges through these regional coordinating groups and any other learning exchanges that might happen in the design sessions, in other gatherings that emerge, in new creative ways of organizing we haven't even thought of yet, they will start to emerge around the natural rhythm of the webinar and design session. The inner space, which Penny is going to talk about in a moment, the work you need to do on yourself internally to be able to do this work, this is where grieving and trauma and leadership capacities, Penny's going to talk about this in a moment, is offered in the design school and is decoupled, meaning it's placed in the off weeks where we don't have webinars and design sessions, so that if you choose to, you can attend them and there's no conflict in time. Then there's the on-the-ground activities. On-the-ground activities are things like Roberta Hill in Norway, Maine, decides to host a gathering on a Saturday. And people from Connecticut, they're only a few hours away, decide, decide to drive up and join it because they see Roberta's doing awesome stuff in Maine. And so on the ground activities are activities organized by you in your landscapes that you can connect with other members of the design school or other members of your community who aren't in the design school, but that these are activities that are made coherent by what we're doing in this learning journey. Then there are bioregional activations. We haven't really defined bioregional activations. Some of you may know what they are, but basically this is where Penny and I are invited by a local team to come and activate bioregional regeneration processes in local communities. So this is like in two weeks, Penny and I are invited to Maine and invited to Connecticut and Massachusetts, where we're gonna do some activation activities. And these are going to be coherent with the webinar and design session. And we're gonna integrate what we can from those experiences into the learning journey. Then also, we're gonna invite activities to help you to weave your own local communities. As an example, we're gonna invite you to map local regenerative education projects, and then to convene people who manage them and to start to weave them into an ecosystem. So you'll be weaving your own local communities if you're in a role of seeking to do that, and that is going to happen around and separate from the time of the webinar and design session. And then we have all kinds of self-guided learning resources. If you go into the design school on Mighty Networks, you'll see there's a self-guided learning journey section with a whole bunch of learning journeys. We've got about 50 hours of webinars there. You can go and just dive as deep as you want. Also, the different geographic reasons, uh, regions have their own resource hubs. I would specifically encourage you to check out the Cascadia Resource Hub and the Northern Andes Resource Hub to see really good examples. Because the Cascadia Resource Hub is populated with a lot of materials from the Regenerate Cascadia Tour and the Northern Andes Resource Hub, 
I have populated with a lot of materials from work we're doing in Barichara, Colombia. Also, there's a design school resource hub filled with hundreds of hours of content. Go and find that Wikipedia of materials and dive in and swim around to your heart's content. The resource hubs are full of self-guided learning opportunities. And then we're also going to offer, as a sneak preview of, of auxiliary actions, we're gonna offer mapping and capacity building exercises for your bioregions as part of the learning journey. And then we're also gonna be hosting uh, campfires, which are basically social gathering spaces for connectivity and conversation about the important matters of the moment. And so you can see all of these other activities, you're invited to join as many or lead as many as you like, or just attend the webinars and design sessions. See how we've created a minimal structure to allow you to go as deep as you want or as minimal as you want, knowing that all these other things are happening is how we're gonna build coherence. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Penny to talk about two of the design school's offerings in particular that are not technically part of the learning journey, but that you might be interested in anyway. So over to you, Penny. Thanks, yeah, so I'll just do this briefly, but to say that um, as Joe was saying, on the alternate weeks, so on the off weeks between the webinars and design sessions, I'm going to be hosting um, some activities in the inner space on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock central. And then on Fridays, I'll be hosting a campfire uh, at the same time at 11 a.m. central. And um, so the inner space, the inner space is for the work that we all know we have to do to build our inner capacities, the inner capacities that we need to do this work. This bioregional regeneration work is, as Joe was saying, it's on the cutting edge, it's on the frontier space. And so every single one of us who is doing this work is going to meet our own inner edges. We're going to meet our edges and um, be stopped by them. And we need support to move through that. And it's it's a different kind of support because we're doing a different kind of work. So I'll be hosting these sessions every other week and we're gonna do different kinds of things. So you can, you can learn a little bit more about what we're gonna be doing in uh, a recording that we just posted there in the inner space of our opening gathering where I described more of the types of things that we're gonna be doing. Like we're going to be doing heart circles, we're going to be doing storytelling circles, we're going to be doing teach-ins and embodiment exercises, we're going to have community hosted events. So check out that recording if you're interested in this work. We all know that this is as much of an inside job as an outside job. So um, I really, really encourage you if you have interest and the time to come to these events. And then Fridays, as Joe was saying, uh, a little bit about campfires. They're based on a social technology called the yarn. It's an indigenous technology from Australia that's described in the book Sand Talk. And um, this is, we don't come with an agenda, but you sort of imagine you're sitting around a campfire and maybe a real campfire if you're in your landscapes doing this. And um, and there's no agenda, but it's like you're weaving a yarn. So we all check in with what's coming up for us, like specifically in the learning journey, in our bioregional regeneration work. And then we start to yarn a conversation just organically. And uh, it really brings out really interesting nuances, really interesting threads that we can pull on to um, to deepen our work. So So that's it. And it also builds really strong relationships among the people who attend them. Yeah. So campfires are a great place to get to get to know other members of the design school. And so what you can see is that we're holding a huge complex mess of things because this is complex work. And in order to see how we structure the learning journey to focus it, I'm just going to very briefly name that there are structures and models and frameworks of bioregional regeneration that are going to organize the content and the processes and the flow of the learning journey. And just to briefly name them, because we're going to go into these more in another time, one of the big things is that we're going to organize all of our work around landscape structures, things like watersheds, things like floodplains, things like coastal estuaries. And we're going to learn about how to create bioregional learning centers by weaving a tapestry of what exists within the landscape that is about learning how to live in a healthy and resilient way in that place. And the bioregional learning center is our main focus of the learning journey. But also, we're going to have to explore territorial governance. 
How do we deal with funding issues? How do we set priorities? How do we make decisions? Who makes decisions? How does authority and sovereignty emerge for local people to manage local affairs? So territorial governance is gonna be a theme throughout the learning journey as well. We're also gonna talk about tapestries of local projects of existing and new regenerative work and how to weave them together and how to create ecosystems of learning. And this way of thinking it shows us that we need to cooperate at the scale of landscapes, which means we'll also be talking about the design of pro-social contexts. How do we create shared agendas? How do we cultivate shared identity and shared purpose? How do we set up decision-making frameworks? How do we set up conflict resolution uh, frameworks so that this work can occur within our landscapes? All of this is part of learning how to birth a bioregional learning center. And so the idea is this, that there's a bioregional regeneration platform that we'll be exploring, looking at learning ecosystems and bioregional learning centers, how to map and weave tapestries of local projects, which always implies collaborative funding and governance. So we'll continually revisit that throughout so that we can create bioregional networks on every continent. And what this means in practical terms is the learning journey is about creating shared language around bioregional regeneration, things like these concepts, that it's also gonna be about growing into a community of practice around shared models and approaches. We're gonna to practice together doing similar things in different landscapes so that we can learn how to be in the same community of practice through those models and approaches. We're gonna apply these tools and frameworks to our own communities, to our own work. This isn't a, uh, an intellectual exercise because we're in the seventh fire. We need to actually apply what we're learning to the real world. And that's how we're going to hold the coherence within our own bioregions and through exchanges among different landscapes. Now, one thing I want to stress is that all of this is about increasing coherence across different regenerative communities, which means all of us in this learning journey are also part of other regenerative communities. And we need coherence across all of them. And we're going to use this learning journey to help build that coherence. So if you are in transition towns, if you're in the Global Eco Village Network, if you're in a permaculture center, any of the what are actually more than a million regenerative projects and processes around the world, we need coherence among them. And you can see how the way we've designed this learning journey is to increase coherence across all of them by increasing coherence among each other in shared language and practices and in holding the complexity of what we're doing throughout the next six months. And so that's a lot to chew on. I'm guessing you might have some questions. Maybe you need to think about it a little bit. You might have some comments about what you're seeing here. So, so now we have some time that we can talk about this. And so, I wanna bring us back into focus and say, you can see that this is not a normal online course. You might even notice that the focus is not on content. Like Joe is going to teach you how the spin dynamics of electrons work. It, no, no, it's like, it's not about content of knowledge. It's about the practices together in the shared culture. And so what I'd love to do now, is I see a whole bunch of comments came in. I don't get, have time to see, oh my gosh. Sorry, I don't get to see what you all have said because there's too much there. But what I'd love to do is invite anyone who would like to raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. And the way you can do that is there's a little button at the bottom called reactions. You can click there and you'll see raise hand. And then that'll put you up at the front of the queue. And then we can address any questions or comments in the order that they come in. And so are there any questions or comments that people have about what you have just heard? Aletta, welcome. Come on in. Hi, Joe, Penny. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very excited about this. I'm just curious um, from my experience of doing training and work on the ground, I always have uh, approached it from an annual perspective, you know, so that one has the opportunity to go through all four seasons and all four, you know, uh, points of celebration. So I'm curious to know, um, why did you decide to go for a half year? Because immediately I'm like, well, you know, you guys are going to be going through through um, summer and I'm going to be going through winter, you know. Um, yeah, so if you could speak to that, please. It's a great question. And the answer is in two parts. One is, we do these bioregional activations and we do a lot of other work. And our health already collapsed last year. We both got really sick and we learned we need rhythms of our own health and well being. 
So we're holding a pattern for the, the design school to have a coherent learning journey and then maintain social activities and learning scaffolding in the time in between. Because the work we're doing in our landscapes, I would say is 200 to 500 year timeframes. So we're not gonna have finished it in six months or a year. Um, and so part of this is the recognition that we're trying to find balance between online and on the ground and also in our own lives as human beings holding the process. And so like we would much rather spend other parts of the year doing something like, wow, we came and spent a month in Southern Africa and came to work with you. You know, like things that we'd have a hard time doing while maintaining the learning journey's rhythm. And also that um, that sort of spring to fall rhythm of the Northern hemisphere, at least, that sort of harvest, that, that planting to harvest dynamic is shared by enough parts of the world that we can at least use it as as a scaffold <laughs> within the other constraints we have to deal with. Because I actually think that once the learning journey ends, it's not like everything ends. It's mm. just that this particular rhythm will end. And then we'll take a break and return to this rhythm again because all the other work and all the other activities will continue. Mm. But yeah, it's Thank a you. really good question. Um, and mostly it's the practical constraints of, we don't want to die. We kind of like being alive. <laughs> <laughs> and we got really sick last time. We've got to find rhythms for this. Okay, I see Bill. Hey, Bill. Welcome. Come on in. Great. Hey there. Um, thanks, uh, Joe and Penny. Um, I had a question following up on your um, introduction of the idea of, of creating coherence with um, just the, the, the opposite of that and um, incoherence. And so, you know, I think this may tie into the inner work, but um, just addressing briefly, like, ways of um, handling incoherence, both within this container of, of this learning journey, but then also, you know, as we know, there's bioregioning work that's happening that isn't in this container. And so creating coherence um, across initiatives is also a challenge that, that we've discussed. And so I'd love to just present some of that presence, uh, ask you to present some of that discussion and, and ways of, of engaging with um, incoherence. Mm. Thank you, Bill. And I know you manage a lot of these complexities in your work at R3.0. Um, you're a cat hoarder, cat herder extraordinaire. Um, that one of the things that I, I think is really fundamental in this is deep framing. Um, back when I worked with George Lakoff doing cognitive linguistics in like 2007, a long time ago, he differentiated between um, surface frames and deep frames. Surface frames being common sense understandings from your daily life and deep frames being organizing principles for how you experience reality. Like the clockwork universe and seeing the universe as this dead clockwork mechanism of, of Galileo and Descartes is a deep frame. And I think at the deep frame level, what we really need to cultivate coherence around is bioregionalism, not the word bioregion, but the way of being. You know, whether we say this is an indigenous life way, or we say this is how to be in harmony with your landscape, or you're part of the unfolding story of your place, to build coherence around the deep frames of bioregional existence, regardless of the words, I think is going to really help build coherence across the many diverse efforts. Similarly, um, scale of approach, which is related, but like, okay, that's great. You have your permaculture farm on five acres of land. I love it. But what are you doing about your watershed, where the water upstream and drains onto it and then drains off the downstream? So I think this land, this holistic landscape way of approaching things, like the way Common Land Foundation does and other groups. There are a lot of groups doing that. But if we get more coherence that that's the minimum scale, we have to actually grow to the scale of these holistic landscapes, that that will build a great deal of coherence regardless of which movements, who's leading them, whether the leaders like each other, all that humanity, all that humanity that happens, as we know. So I would say it's these deeper, um, like shared perspectives that, that um, are where I think that coherence is gonna be most important. And I, uh, I'll yeah. just add the one thing, one aspect of this I feel that's, I think we all know is the trauma work that we all need to do um, individually, but also collectively. And um, because we all know where things break down, it's when, when we go a little crazy and uh, and we start to just basically fight with each other or get stuck in our own egos or get defensive or whatever it is, and or there's the collective trauma level, like with indigenous cultures the and in our own culture, 
um, that we need to work with. So I would say that that inner work side of this is just as important. Like we 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 have to do that work or it just it never works. It never it, we can't do the outer work. Yep. And yeah. Bill, you're a living example of that because you, <laughs> you do so much inner work yourself. <laughs> um, but yeah, to be continued, I think this is this is going to be a recurring theme is how do we navigate these real human complexities and real information level complexities? Just like tracking all that's happening is too complex. So what do we do? And, you know, the, the meta crisis and the poly crisis and these other dimensions. But yeah, Bill, thanks for bringing that in. It's super important. And John, I see your hands up. So John, over to you. Welcome. Oh, oh muted. you're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. Yeah, hi, hi, Joe. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a point. It probably follow, follows on from the previous point about coherence. Um, we're in the Upper Thames in England. Um, I used to live over on the West Coast in Berkeley, California as well, so I've got quite a strong alignment with over there. But I'm very mindful of the fact that while we're discussing shared models and agendas, that the, the incredible diversity of responses and solutions is something I'd like to ensure that as we go forwards, that it, that is something that is uh, at the forefront, rather than permitting ourselves to come down to narratives and discourses that render things a bit too similar. I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll, I'll add a comment to the effect of one of the big differentiators we found in regenerative leadership is a capacity for spiritual devotion to place, which is some people have very deep spiritual devotion to their place, but you can see how that can be expressed in a myriad of different ways that if people can express their devotion to place in the Amazon rainforest, very different than they would in another landscape, but this devotional quality. And I think there are gonna be some similar sort of thematic resonance and then diversity of ways of actually doing things, which is that there's gonna be some things that will be common, even common at a certain, almost like a meta level, like, oh, this devotional quality needs to be present, but how is it expressed? Oh, it's expressed in lots of different ways, but but actually very few people do it. So we need more people doing it. So I think there's gonna be some interesting blends in that. But at the same time, I just wanna acknowledge, yes, please, to a diversity of approaches. Um, I think it's very, very important. So, so thank you for bringing that in. And then I see Shimon has his hand up. So Shimon, over to you and welcome, good to see you. Yeah, hello everybody. Hello, Joe, hello, Penny. I'm just curious, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I was curious on your thoughts about the oceans. And I say that because you'll remember, I grew up on some islands and so, I appreciate you kind of sharing the context of the learning that kind of led to this. I've been involved in some of that. I mean, everything makes sense. Uh, not that you need me to say that, meaning, oh, yeah, of course, the, let's go where most of the people are and like scale that out and connect. And then as somebody who's kind of grew up in the oceans, you know, there's just less of us. And what about those kind of large areas? Now, of course, where people are, we do all that could influence and affect that. So I get that. I'm just wondering your thoughts, because you kind of think about everything, Joe. So, um, and I doubt I've caught you out. So is it, you know, we're starting where the people are, and it'll just influence and affect that, or it's later, or there's a whole oceans unit uh, <laughs> of the learning journey, uh, which might be a little more challenging. Because uh, like I said, the, the people aren't there, who's going to organize and um, yeah. Uh, Thank you for bringing this in because um, land chauvinism is a real thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to, to invite you to watch it if you don't know about it. In the design school, there's an earth systems learning journey section. Right. And in there is a talk called Thinking Like a River. I don't know if you've seen that one yet. But what we explored, what I explored, I was, I was when I led the webinar, but we explored how to think like a river by looking at things like temperature variation on the middle of the Pacific Ocean to change the course of storm tracks, mm. to basically get people thinking in terms of holistic hydrological processes. And I wanted to name that way of thinking, not just for the water that arrives on land, but that as you know, having grown up on an island in the middle of the ocean, the, the foundation of life on earth is from the ocean, <laughs> like right. uh, where all life came from. And there are big problems right now with, you know, phytoplankton and real questions about the food chain. And so what I think is gonna be interesting for us is to see how do we move from human bioregional thinking 
things like, oh, I'm a human in Cascadia, there's a human bioregion, and then something like Salmon Nation, which is an attempted at envisioning a bioregion that blends with the, the, the bioregion of salmon. Uh, there can be very interesting ways of bringing that into Earth systems thinking about ocean processes. And so just naming that I see a really natural continuity is my way of saying it, that it's very appropriate to bring the ocean into this conversation, any place that it feels appropriate to do so, and that it will be relevant to that context. Um, even though we'll tend to be thinking of things like, oh, the Connecticut River happens to be on land. Yeah. you know. Um, so I think that this blend is going to be really important as we decolonize, as we unlearn, as we break down some of the standard framing. And so thank you for inviting that by uh, by naming the oceans. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And, and that makes sense. I think it's going to be interesting, though, just because less people place based in the ocean yeah. to identify with it and hold that. Uh, although I know islands do have in Crumman Island or other islands. It's kind of there's a way in which you think of it as going for hundreds and thousands of miles around your island. So, yeah. Cool. No, thank you for that, Shimon. And then Roger, over to you. Welcome. Hey there. Thanks. Great to see you again. <clears throat> you too. Uh, yeah, from our pro-social. Um, <clears throat> thinking about coherence and language and coming together on that. Um, thinking about from pro-social, the, um, you know, the Eleanor Austral pro-social um, patterns. Um, and then the work that David Bullier did with Silke Helfridge on the triad of commoning patterns. Um, I'm one, I'm thinking that there are bioregional patterns that can help us provide prototypical things that can be applied in the diversity of different places and, and, and things. And want to talk to you about how might we build new patterns, new ontologies, whatever, check. Ooh. Um, I'll just very briefly say, yes, please, let's do that. <laughs> Um, and I'll add in one comment, which is that um, we, I meant to add myself, not kick you out of the screen. Sorry about that. Um, I clicked the wrong button, uh, is, which is that part of being pro-social is to connect to, to empathetically and in a sort of constructed social way to empathetically connect with commons. And one of the best commons to think about that we need to work on is the biosphere, like Earth as a whole. And so, uh, and then you can bring that down to whatever other subscale of life is appropriate to you, your local watershed, uh, deer that live in the forest nearby and what have you. And I think this extension of pro-social into these ecological realms is a very, very natural extension. Also related to uh, the work David Sloan Wilson has been doing on the newosphere um, with, uh, with related kinds of explorations that I think are gonna be very appropriate. So, so thank you for bringing this in. And yes, we can definitely explore this as we move along. And then Peter, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, Mother Nature, metaphorically speaking, is a very important collaborator in our learning. In fact, I think she's getting a little impatient that we're not learning fast enough. <laughs> Most of us, uh, of course, are indigenous folks that um, have been listening more carefully. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I know that you're going to a foundation meeting, I think close to Bogota, and you showed the images of all the uh, forest fires there. Each one of us is being affected on an almost daily basis by opportunities to learn from the changes that are just frighteningly uh, complex and yet uh, dramatic. So I guess my sense going forward, um, and, and it is the future of bioregions, Bioregions are going to have to form because other more complicated structures are going to be collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess there are, there are teachable moments. Learning is more about emotions than it is about thinking. How do you fit into either the metaphorical concept of Mother Nature as a co-instructor or perhaps the chief instructor and this notion that maybe there are times and situations where we can learn from each other partly by how we address uh, or don't address the disasters that are occurring in our own regions. Mm. You know, where you live is such a beautiful example because the Cuyahoga River was the river that started on fire 16 times. And there was a period of time where the whole world was like, wait, rivers can start on fire? What the hell? Um, and so so I, I think that kind of, um, I mean, that's a kind of shock treatment to awaken our emotions. Um, 
But uh, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the best teacher for all of this is going to be Mother Nature, and which, in a sort of very literally true way, all of us are part of Mother Nature. So even learning from each other is sort of like a subset of Mother Nature, if you will. Uh, and I know I know you know that. But I think that the best teacher in this learning journey, if we do a good job, will be those of us who have fallen in love with our own landscapes, having our landscapes teach others. So I'm thinking like Shimon saying, I'm from the islands, even though he lives in Seattle now. It's like, well, the islands can teach us because it's a place that I love. And I think that there's this way that we can be conduits of love, basically feeling deep connection to the living presence and intelligence of our landscapes, and then be the pathway for that to come to other people. And a great way that I think we can do that is with things like bioregional walks. Like we're probably gonna do some bioregional walks while we're in Maine in a week. And wouldn't it be great if our friends we're gonna see a few days later in Connecticut could join us? I think logistically, we may not work that out in the short time we have, but in the next six months, part of the geographic clustering is, oh, there's someone that's only like five or six hours away and they're doing an event on a Saturday, I could actually go and meet them in person. And this way of coming to each other's landscapes within appropriate logistical distance, like how we came to you because we were already going to Rochester, you know, when we were thinking last year and that all just self-organized, like wasn't that far to go from Rochester to Cleveland that, you know, when you're already traveling anyway, or there's a bus or a train. And so I think there's a really good way for us to, to seek that connection as a priority to seek the connection of land in each other's landscapes as well as our own. Because one of the best ways to learn our own landscapes is to experience the love someone has for another one. And then come back and go, oh, I was taking my own for granted. And so um, so I think there's a lot that we're gonna learn in that way. Um, so, so thank you so much for bringing it up. Super important. And then I see Sherry's got her hand up. Sherry, over to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm on the phone and, and uh, I can't, sometimes the button to unmute and unmute is it's so difficult. First of all, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just love seeing the brilliance of both of you together and um, what a what an, a great offering. And um, I just feel the timeliness of this so powerfully. And um, I put in the chat that right now in Mexico, there is a gathering um, for the eighth fire. So I think that's really important for people to kind of go, oh, wow, yeah, the seventh fire, woo. And we're on that cusp of like the eighth fire and the time of prophecies come alive and that we're really in a very, very powerful time and the universe is supporting us. And um, uh, there's so much to share, but just on to the last couple points that you were, people were bringing in, I really highly recommend we uh, people read the chapter by Robin Kim uh, Wall Kimmerer on the grammar of animacy, because that chapter is sort of like, heals that rift between us and nature and our love. Like when everything is animate, then you're just like, well, yeah, I'm in love with, with everything around me. And um, I think that is really where that, you know, love is connection and is wholeness and is, and, and so, we're really like earth as lover. Um, so I wanted to say that. And then I think Ben Roberts, it's hard for me to, I'm in my car to see the chat, but I saw Ben say something about Meg Wheatley. And I, I just want to say when you were talking kind of your last comments about what's happening around the, the uh, with this um, journey and the cross pollination and the, uh, sharing of experiences is that I saw the Meg Wheatley framework. It's a framework of, of the life cycle of emergence, taking social innovation to scale, which I know you're familiar with and some others are too. That framework of networks, communities of practice, which is what we're talking about here, and then connecting those communities of practice into a system of influence. And that power of this as a system of influence on the planet cannot be understated. And I've been waiting for the system of influence capacity <laughs> to, to happen. So I'm like, yay, it's here. Um, so I, uh, I really do feel that strongly. And um, I just wanted to express my gratitude and I look forward to playing in the field. Mm, thank you, Sherry. And for anyone who wants to know more about Meg Wheatley's work, in addition to her amazing books, the Burkana Institute, 
has a lot of those resources and frameworks from their like 30 years of putting it into practice. And uh, and it is really good stuff. So Sherry, thanks for bringing that up. And love for earth, heck yeah, that's where this is at. And I see Felipe's here. Felipe, bienvenido, como estas? Hola, hello everybody. Hola, gracias. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna make this in English because I guess most of the people are uh, not Spanish speakers. So my question to you guys is like, I know that you've been working on that in Barichara in Colombia for some some time. And my question is, how do you manage or deal with, uh, I mean, to build this uh, bioregional in a atmosphere of post-conflict or still some conflict that we have in Colombia? I would like to know a little bit about that. Ah, mm. uh, gosh, we should have a, we should meet in person and talk about this. <laughs> Aren't you in Boyacá or where are you at? Where are you located? Yeah, I mean, in between uh, Paipa and, Baric and um, uh, Duitama in a land here, so just arriving. Nice. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, Barichar is so interesting for this because it was the most violent place during the violence, and now it's this island of peace and stability. Mm -hmm. And yet, the local campesino culture is almost destroyed by speculative real estate and tourism. And so, it's this very complex, just in one place, like Barichar, it's very complex. We mm -hmm. were in Putumayo a few weeks ago where we could, you know, I know very little about Putumayo. I could feel its significance, but I, I was there for three days. So what do I know? I know I know very little. But I learned that, you know, Alto Putumayo and Bajo is Putumayo, where you go to the, mm -hmm. the lower part. For those who don't know, Putumayo is one of the headwaters of the Amazon in Southeastern Colombia. And there's some very wonderful and amazing indigenous cultures there. Um, and the, the lower part, it's hot, and there's coca and cocaine, and narco traffickers and guerrillas and paramilitaries. And you gotta be careful because you can get killed. And then the upper part, it's much safer. And so these, these complex dynamics are always present in Colombia. They're present everywhere. And for me as an outsider, I just trigger them. You know, complete, I walk into a room, they go gringo and they come up, you know? So, so I get to see them a lot is what I would say. <laughs> but then I learned there's a woman from Boyacá who's from Leva who's here in Barichara. She married a, a man from Barichara. And she experienced exactly the same judgments and accusations and the trauma patterns of the local people. They, they did mm. the same things to her that they did to me. They just did it to her 10 years earlier. So it wasn't that I was from, the North, from North America. It's that I wasn't from Barichara. And so this yeah. kind of dynamic is, well, we'll talk about it. I would just say we'll talk. Cool. I moved to Canada. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, to be continued. Um, and yeah, th this pattern of peace building and regeneration, that's going to mm. be a pattern we're going to come back to over and over again. Because when we were with the Haudenosaunee people in Ontario and in New York, the way that they constructed peace, I felt a deep resonance and similarity with the Kamsa people in Putumayo. Very different cultures, very different histories, but both of them are very good at constructing peace. Mm in very different ways. So I think that there's a there's a lot that we'll learn in this in this tension. Yeah, and we have a couple of people in Lebanon um, who are part of the Mediterranean group. So they're right near all the violence happening there. So there's, uh, you know, people in this learning journey asking the exact same questions from different parts of the world. So so it's a really good question. Yes, yeah. to, to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> and then Claire, over to you. Yeah, um, this is uh, maybe a little harder to articulate, but I'm going to try. Um, is, you know, one of the things that I have observed from doing a lot of the grassroots work that I've done um, is that people with the best laid intentions continually, like they will, it will look like you're doing the work, the, the transformative work, and actually it, starts to become clear after a while that you're actually repeating the same systems that um and so like to me that just that is learning um and it's the ability to learn and the thing is is that you can i love i love the fact that the um the inner space that the the inner work is being so platformed and sort of critically part of this but 
often I think um, the people who haven't had a voice, maybe not even people, the 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 human and the not the um, more than human or whatever, what 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 a um, the yeah non-human and human, um, that that takes a different kind of listening and a different kind of um, being present with to actually even have the learning sink in. It's it really difficult to articulate late. And I think that's part of why it's often just brushed off to the side. But there's a kind of um, humility, like the art ceremony, being in awe, um, like allowing the wonder, the mystery to, to come in. That, like, to me feels like a really, um, if that isn't part of how we learn, then I think we're missing something. So I just wanted to just name those things. Um, I know that, and I anyway, um, I, I, at the end of the day, I'm not interested in rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And so how do we do that? And it's just, you know, that part that often doesn't get named. So I just wanted to bring that in. Here is to not just reorganizing the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, I think that this, the insight that Claire has just brought us about how we need diverse ways of knowing and diverse ways of learning. Um, as a, um, a Colombian scholar, what's his first name? I'm forgetting his first name, calls uh, Design for the Pluriverse. His last name's Escobar, mm. his first name. Um, no, it's not Pablo Escobar. Oh, the other guy. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> anyway, but uh, Arturo, Arturo. 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 Arturo Escobar. Um, and, and how important it is to design for multiple ontologies, multiple ways of knowing is super important in this. Um, what I want to maybe to bring us to a close today and say, what we can see in this learning journey is that it is going to be different. And I don't just mean it's different from other learning journeys or different from other online courses, but it's actually gonna be different as it progresses. It's gonna change as we go because we're gonna be learning as we're doing things. And what we're hoping to support as a focus is how do we create learning exchanges among people and across landscapes as we practice this in our own communities so that we can see how, one, we're not alone when we're doing this. Some of us have felt alone in doing this, sometimes for decades. And also that, um, that what we're doing does have pattern levels of coherence, that there are coherent ways to work with the patterns. And that those coherent ways can be learned, they can be taught, they can be imitated, they can be replicated, they can be adapted and changed in different contexts. And also that there's no time to waste because you know, learning by doing is, is a requirement as the way to learn this anyway. And also there's no time to learn it and then wait five years and then go do it. And so what we wanna see happen is in the next six months to actually weave energy and, and relationships into landscapes that are your energy and your relationships in your landscapes. And then we just wanna help this to occur. And so the, the dynamism of this and the real power of this is what we can learn from each other as we walk this path into being. And so, so in sort of a closing summary of what we've seen today is that this learning journey is going to have a very minimal structure for anyone who just wants to attend the webinars or watch the webinars later, that's great. If you want to join the design sessions, join the design sessions. That's great. We're going to do great stuff there. If you're really busy and you come and go, that's fine. But if you're really working on this, like in your landscape, in your community, you're organizing a team and you need to do things like facilitating processes in your community, creating budgets, finding funding, mobilizing resources, we're going to be doing all of it somewhere within this network. Some of us are doing each part at any time. And what we want to do is create learning across those ways of doing things throughout the next six months. And as we do that, we're going to learn a lot about how to birth bioregional learning centers. And so um, that's the sort of the method to the madness is an emergent improvisation around a set of principles and practices that we know work, and then focusing them on this incredibly complex scale. Just how do we learn together as we each do this and as we help each other to do it and as we just become friends along the way, which is extremely important. And so with that, I wanna say thank you all for your attention, for joining us for 90 minutes. Um, I'll have the recording posted online. And also 
we're, we're not going to make all webinars public, but we're going to make this webinar public, which means you can share the recording of this webinar with anyone you like. If there's anyone you think should be in the learning journey, or if they just want to know what the heck it is we're doing over here, and they don't join the learning journey, you can still share this. This introductory webinar is going to give a nice overview of what we're doing. And we're not trying to be secretive. We're just trying to have coherent ways of relating. And so... So you'll be able to share this recording with others to invite them into the English or the Spanish version. Well, obviously, they need to speak English to follow this one. Um, we're going to repeat this webinar in Spanish in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and then otherwise, hit us up with questions. Penny and I are on the platform. You know how to find us. And we're looking forward to learning with you. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.